the Fayetteville Board of Education. This is June 25th, 2020. So welcome to our, hopefully our last Zoom meeting. <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. Do you wanna introduce our Pledge of Allegiance crowd? We have a special group to do the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Three very soon to be graduates next week and then two rising seniors. Joining us are Zane Thompson, Gabe Craig, Carter Betts, Whitney Waitsman, and Eliza Hapgood. And I believe they're out on the lake. If you would lead us in the pledge. Yes, we are on the lake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. Okay. Bye. All right. Roll call. Um, Alan, can you call the roll, please? Nika Wayne. Here. Megan Hurley. Here. Tim Hudson. Here. Justin Eichmann. Here. Katrina Osborne. Here. Tracy Pomeroy. Here. And Keaton Smith. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to start, I guess we don't have any recognitions tonight, right, Alan? Um, but we do, have, we do have several um, citizen participations that have been submitted. So um, just a reminder for all of you that have joined us uh, this afternoon for uh, citizen participation, we, um, we allow five minutes per person and Alan is gonna kind of keep a clock on that so he may need to interrupt if necessary, but we are glad you're here and we look forward to hearing what you have to say for us. We also don't, um, uh, it's not a conversation, just a presentation. So thank you for coming. And our first citizen participation is Anna Bullion. Or I think, is she here? Are you there, Anna? There she is. Okay, Anna, go ahead. Good evening and thank you. I uh, wasn't sure if I saw Dr. Colbert, but anyway, President Waitsman and members of the board for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Anna Beaulieu and I'm here before you as a veteran teacher with 20 years of service in Fayetteville Public Schools, a member of the Certified Personnel Policies Committee and as the president of the Fayetteville Education Association. I wanted to speak to you tonight because as the decision-making body of the district, you hold my future and the future of those I represent in your hands. The upcoming school year poses challenges that we have never seen before and educators at instruction will require creative problem solving, flexibility, and likely a whole lot of Zooms. We understand the magnitude of the task before us and that with each decision comes a hundred details to consider. To make this school year work, it will take courage to try unconventional methods, resolve to stay the course, and strength of character to admit our shortfalls. Most importantly, it will take a collaborative effort amongst stakeholders where all input is considered and no single perspective is valued over another if we hope to effectively and successfully execute our plan for learning. As you are well aware, the Department for Elementary and Secondary Education has released its guidance for the reopening of schools in the form of the Arkansas Ready for Learning model. Additionally, they have created a bundle of waivers for which school districts who intend to follow this plan may apply. These waivers purportedly anticipate obstacles to the implementation of the Arkansas Ready for Learning model and provide districts the tools to easily modify policies in their efforts to implement blended learning systems. Full disclosure, FEA and its members are joining forces with Arkansas Education Association members across the state to stop the unilateral application of these waivers or at the very least narrow their scope with the addition of specific language. Because if there's one thing that I have learned through PPC, it's that words matter. And sometimes 
the absence of words matters even more. It is my understanding that the Fayetteville School District intends to use the Arkansas Ready for Learning model and the waivers that come with it. Therefore, I feel it is incumbent upon me to share the concerns that educators have regarding these waivers, as well as the potentially negative ramifications that they may have on our district. This bundle method reeks of a one-size-fits-all approach where ease of implementation is valued above all else and essentially eliminates all perspectives save one. The most egregious of the proposed waivers are those concerning the personnel policy committees. These waivers effectively strip employees of the right to participate in the shaping of policies that are our contract. The need to waive the rights of the PPCs to review, revise, or reject personnel policy changes presumes that educators will automatically disagree with changes proposed by the administrative team. Given our shared belief in the importance of working together, I think that this is an extremely risky presumption. In my experience, the best results come when we co-create our commitments. Disagreements are inevitable, but not insurmountable. Using a waiver to circumvent the PPC sets a dangerous precedent for future superintendents and board members who may not be as keen on collaboration as our current team. Over the past couple of years, there has been a concerted effort to rebuild trust and to encourage the belief that we are one as Fayetteville Public Schools. I'm struggling to understand how waiving the rights and protections of the educators who will play a pivotal role in a successful transition to on-site instruction will be to the benefit of anyone who is a part of our school community. The approval of these waivers transfers all accountability from the school district to the educator, while at the same time denying the educator any recourse should the parties disagree. Although these waivers are set to expire in one year, the personnel policies changed or created in that same time frame will not. I would like to reiterate that these policies are our contract and no employee should be required to sign away their rights as a term of employment. Should our quest to stop these waivers at the state level prove unsuccessful, we ask that you, Dr. Colbert and members of the board resolve to make no decisions about us without us. We ask that you provide written assurance that you will involve the employees of Fayetteville Public Schools in the decision-making by honoring the lawfully established process by which PPCs review new and existing policies. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for coming. Um, and okay. And then we have another um, request for citizen participation from Michelle Walk Walchuk. Is that correct? Yes, that is wall chalk, like wall and a piece of chalk. Perfect for a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Well, good evening, President Waitsman, board members, and Dr. Colbert. Um, my name is Michelle Walchok, and I've been an educator for 25 years. I wear many hats in this district. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Vandergriff Elementary. I am a proud parent of a soon-to-be uh, FHS graduate and a rising sophomore. I also proudly serve my profession and fellow colleagues as the elementary at-large board member of FEA and am beginning my second term as a board member on the Arkansas Education Association. I'm a proud employee of this district and my service at the state level has granted me the opportunity to hear about how many districts around the state operate. Uh, these stories leave me with an appreciation for our positive and collaborative working relationship that our educators have with our administration and with you, our board. And this is the first time I felt personally felt that need to speak at a school board meeting. Uh, my PPC and FEA have always been my voice and you always listen. But today I feel compelled to speak to be a visible, albeit virtual, representation of the hundreds of people that PPCs represent. I come to you with my concerns regarding that bundle of waivers that DESE has put together for districts to apply for in this quick streamlined process. Our district, with probably all the other districts across the state, will by tomorrow turn in their assurance and application to waive state laws with regards to how schools will operate this coming school year. The way DESI has set this process up, it just kind of makes things a little complicated. Um, a district applies for the entire bundle of waivers in order to take advantage of this expedited process. 
and they don't have to submit a detailed plan until September 1st, a full three weeks after our school year has begun. Now, while I agree that many of these waivers um, are going to be necessary to operate safely this coming year, for example, waiving the law that requires 40 minutes of recess for our elementary kids, that may be difficult to get in and social distance, um, or a six hour school day if we ever have to go into um, offsite learning days. But there are a couple of these waivers that are of most concern to me that Anna shared as well. And that is waiving those laws that govern both our certified and classified um, employee policies. I think it'd be extremely detrimental to our positive collaborative working relationship to waive both classified and certified PPC laws. Now, Desi on June 11th shared with the state board some policies that may need to be changed this year. And they um, include, but weren't limited to, to things like parent communication, professional development, planning time, leave policies, et cetera. And under this waiver, it feels as if there's a very broad potential for many aspects of educator contracts to be changed with input from the educators. Now, the nature of any waiver is that it waives the district's accountability from following the state law. And in this case, it would transfer all that accountability and possibly risk from the districts to the educators. These waivers are potentially dangerous as they cut out educator voices on important decisions. Waiving a process to implement policies through our PPCs cuts out that deliberative policy proposing body. And these policies are essentially our contracts. So I'm concerned that the terms of my contract could potentially be changed at any time during the school year, um, leaving me with no rights. Again, we enjoy this largely positive and very collaborative working relationship between our PPCs and administrators and you, the board. And I hate for that to be jeopardized by cutting educators out of this process. When the waivers are approved, and they likely will, our, our district would be technically allowed to change our contract at will, and we would have no recourse. Circumventing the PPC should never be an option. PPC is the only way educators are guaranteed to have a voice in the teaching and learning environments of our students and ourselves. All policy changes merit review by stakeholders. I argue that this can be done in a timely manner. We should throw out our processes for hearing the voices of educators in the face of a pandemic. Indeed, we should use our collaborative positive relationship to be even stronger together in the face of this pandemic. The unknown is not a comfortable state for any of us to reside. Educators across the district, state, country, you know, we're all anxious and worried taking out the established process by which our voices are heard will only heighten our anxiety. And we shouldn't allow these uncertain times to remove educators' protections, rights, and voices. These oh, policies- uh, 10 seconds. 10 seconds, okay. Um, it's imperative to tackling this uncertain time, um, PVC policies together. We're one FPS and that can only be true if we continue to work together. I just wanna say that should the state approve these waivers as a bundle on Monday, I urge you to not utilize or act on the PPC specific waivers in our district plan that we have to submit September 1st. Thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, okay. And then we've got our next person is Amber Pinter. And hello, thank you, Superintendent Colbert and President Weitzman and the uh, rest of the board members for allowing um, citizen participation time at the meetings and for listening to our voices. I would like to speak to the health concerns that many teachers feel, myself included, in going back to on-site instruction. And um, I would like for you as a board to, to um, follow the lead of our city council and mayor and um, implement the intent of ordinance um, 6323 in the school setting, as well as is done in public accommodations of businesses in the city of Fayetteville. That's the required mask ordinance. Um, many of, of us are concerned that masks have become politicized unnecessarily and that they truly are a public health tool that can help to keep us safe in our working environment. 
So as, as we all look at school as the place to where do we serve children, it is also a workplace and workplace safety issues definitely come, come to the forefront as well. And so we as, as teachers and bus drivers and cafeteria workers, we as the adult employees on site um, need that protection that is offered through the use of masks by everyone who is able to wear a mask. Um, also, it is for the safety of the children and their families as well. Even though children may not suffer greatly from the coronavirus, they are definitely vectors and spreaders. And so um, I would ask that you seriously consider extending the um, use of masks as a requirement as is being done within the city of Fayetteville that the public schools of Fayetteville follow through with that as well. Um, on the topic of, of health and safety concerns, the other that is of most significance, I think across the board, is concern about social distancing and how our physical structures can actually accommodate the number of students per class and per building. And so, um, I, I just want to bring that to your attention that, at, and I believe that goes along with having masks as required because it will probably not be possible to have six foot of social distance through many classrooms, hallways, other environments, and really the only, only protection for the students, for their families, and for the staff and, and faculty will be the wearing of masks. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Um, and then we have one more citizen participation from uh, Melissa Terry. Oops, unmute. Oh, can you hear me? Yep, we've got you now. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for making this time available. Um, I will um, just keep it short and to the point because I know you have so many things going on. My name is Melissa Terry and I live at, South, at 701 Southwood Avenue. I'm a food policy researcher at the University of Arkansas, a research steering committee member with the National Farm to School Network and co-author of several school food related publications in partnership with the USDA. I wanna preface my remarks by reaffirming my support for and demonstrating commitment to the Fayetteville Public Schools. I've worked with the district to run the Washington Elementary School Garden and Culinary Literacy Program for five years. And <coughs> excuse me, prior to that, worked with the district administration to write the initial farm to school planning grant my children have attended FPS all of their school years and can't wait to start their seventh and ninth grade years, respectively, whenever that is safe and possible. I come before you today to address some confusion about the requirements of the school meal distribution process. Our district staff and frontline nutrition teams have done an amazing job, and my remarks should in no way be construed as criticism of existing efforts. As you are all aware, our county is one of the COVID hotspots in our state, and our state in and of itself is a hotspot in the nation. As such, our institutions are taking proactive social distancing measures that meet the moment that we are in during this public health, health emergency as evidenced by the Fayetteville City Council's recent passage of a mandatory mask up ordinance. When it comes to Fayetteville Public Schools current policies regarding meal distribution, the district is doing a great job and I commend the whole team. The request that I bring before you today is to be proactive in increasing access to these healthy meals by allowing for parents to pick up school meals without having to bring their children. This is a request that is based on social distancing equity in the context of the USDA's national waiver for parent pickup rules which state, pursuant to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, PL 116-127, and based on the exceptional circumstances of this public health emergency, the Food and Nutrition Service is expanding, extending a nationwide waiver 
to support access to nutritious meals while minimizing potential exposure, exposure to the novel coronavirus. FNS recognizes that in this public health emergency, continuing to require children to come to the meal site to pick up meals may not be practical and in keeping with the goal of providing meals while also taking appropriate safety measures. This waiver is effective immediately and remains in effect until August 31st, 2020. As some of you may know, I have been working with the district administration to reach out to our state child nutrition unit personnel who we've been in contact with and have reinforced that the district is absolutely not doing anything wrong, doing all the right things, but to also clarify that there are no additional barriers to the district allowing parents to pick up these meals without their children being present. I've also reached out and forwarded all of our ongoing correspondence to my federal colleagues at the Food and Nutrition Services Division of the USDA, and they have offered to meet with the district administration and the FPS nutrition staff and any of you to clarify that there are no additional reporting requirements and or mandatory ID requirements. I have extended this invitation via email to District Superintendent Dr. Colbert and FPS board chair. And so I wanted to extend this invitation to the rest of the school board so that we can get on the same page because I know that we all share the same goals. We want to increase access to healthy food. We want our kids to stay healthy and we wanna make the healthy choice the easy choice. And so that those are my remarks. I thank you kindly. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate you coming. Um, okay, and that concludes our citizen participation. Um, uh, we'll move on to board liaison reports and we just have one this evening from Tim Hudson. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's uh, safe and healthy. Uh, since I work at Washington Regional, I'm just gonna remind us to keep our hands washed and stay away from the general public as best we can. Um, uh, we had an adult ed, um, the Stephen M. Percival Adult Education Program board met um, earlier in the month. Um, there were some technical uh, challenges for the board, which actually um, was very um, apropos because they were sharing, uh, the staff were sharing some of the challenges that they've had in delivering adult ed programming uh, to the adult ed population. Um, and found uh, that there was, a, in some cases, a very significant lack of, uh, of internet access uh, for, for adult ed students. Um, you may recall that our adult ed learners uh, aren't just uh, within the confines of, of uh, the, the Fayetteville, you know, city limits. And so a number of the folks that are trying to get their, uh, their GEDs and continue their education uh, are challenged in the, uh, in the remote settings. So that is something uh, along with the school district at large and districts around the state that uh, uh, is going to be need to be addressed and, and worked on as they uh, expect to be delivering adult education uh, in a kind of a blended fashion. And that's, uh, that's all I have to share about adult ed right now. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, I can't see the screen because I have too many things I'm trying to look at, but I assume that um, Jennifer is sharing the, well, you all can see the consent agenda here. Um, you'll notice we have a couple of things on there that are, um, Ms. Guess, White. yeah, yes. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I skipped over Dr. Colbert. Thank you. Well, first of all, I don't know if anybody had any questions for Tim. It just occurred to me that um, people may have questions with regard to the um, adult ed update. Anyone? Okay, if not, sorry, Dr. Colbert, back to you and then we'll skip on to this. Whoop, you need to unmute, you're muted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, appreciate it. And also to the board members. Uh, actually, I just like, I have a few things I like to share with the uh, board and the public. Um, one is that we have, and I've missed today, a national 
outstanding assistant principal from Leverett Elementary, and that is no other than Carrie Kinney. Uh, Ms. Kinney has been recognized for her outstanding service and leadership. Uh, she believes in establishing a, a, an, um, a very good um, relationship with the school community. Uh, she spends a lot of time getting to know her students. She spends time uh, bringing them to the, her office just to sit and talk with them, getting to know them, and, and giving them the opportunity to share with her. And she also believes in, 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 in developing leaders in her building. And so we really uh, appreciate all the things that she has done leading her building uh, under the leadership of her uh, principal. So Carrie, today we like to say today is your day. Congratulations for being recognized as a national outstanding assistant principal. Would y'all join me in giving her a clap? Yay, it's way to go, Carrie. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be able to represent Fayetteville Public Schools at the national level. So thank you so much. Thank you, we appreciate you. Job well done, thank you. thank you. And then another group of uh, individuals I like to recognize is uh, uh, from the uh, Fayetteville Public School Task Force. Uh, 34 outstanding members uh, uh, agreed to join that task force. I had charged Dr. Weaver to go ahead and, and establish that committee in order for us to gain some insight from teachers, uh, both uh, um, and all, as well as classified employees in the district as well as parents. So they came together and, and really had a great discussion to identify a lot of things that we did that was great and also identify some things that we may need to think twice before we go back into the situation of AMI and all. But we really appreciate the hard work, work that they uh, did and, and bringing back some suggestions that we will be utilizing as we continue to build the Ready uh, to Learn uh, School for Fayetteville Public Schools. So I want to say thank you to those 34 members. You will be hearing more uh, from the committee later on under the leadership of Dr. Weaver. And uh, I do want to send a shout out to Dr. Dugan also, who was very instrumental in serving as a facilitator for this group. So I want to say thank you very much to her for a job well done. And as we continue, you know, the work has, has to continue. Uh, they did some great work, but as you know, that we're still getting ready to think about how we're going to reopen school this fall. And so in order for us to continue to look at that, because we do not know how the, how the 20, uh, 2021 school year is going to look. So therefore we're going to keep this uh, committee intact. I want you to know that we had the foresight of developing this committee prior to the announcement of the governor saying that uh, with the uh, ready to learn uh, committee that came back said, hey, every school should have a ready to learn committee, but we are a step ahead of that. We have a committee already in place. So therefore we will continue to utilize their services and we will go ahead and extend that to additional members. And of course, we would like to invite uh, the uh, board members uh, to join us and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Wakesman would uh, do that, either uh, appoint someone to serve on that committee with us. And we'd like to reach out to the medical field as well as you know, we have a partnership with the Education Foundation. We like to make sure that they are part of the discussion. And, and since we do have, uh, have uh, utilized uh, different services with the Boys and Girls Club, we need a representative from them because we need to talk about the after school program, which we know is still going to be a very important piece uh, to this uh, success of what we do with kids. So I know parents are really interested and say, hey, are we going to be able to do the boys and girls program at the different schools? So therefore we do need their input. So uh, those are additional groups that we like to bring in as well as the city uh, staff, as well as the chambers. So since we're all in, to, in this together, we feel that we like to expand that and bring those additional members on board. And, and Dr. Weaver will be uh, overseeing that group again that we'll probably bring them back together uh, probably this summer as well as throughout the year. But we, I, I do like to again say thank you very much for those current 34 members for doing an ex outstanding job and, and trying to give us some feedback that we can use in order to develop of a plan for uh, ready to learn in the Fayetteville Public School System. And then lastly, I'd like to recognize uh, our uh, nutrition staff members. You know, they really have gone beyond the call of duty and making sure that we provided uh, meals to other uh, families throughout this summer and throughout the dismissal of school early uh, in uh, March and April and May. And just a little background about uh, how many meals that they have served. Uh, you know, 
the total as of this week, we have served 123,240 meals. And then I would like to just, uh, that, that's the meal. You know, we knew that we had to be uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, exposing kids and also the staff members. So we, you know, we used to have serving meals five days a week, but we felt that, hey, let's cut that down so we can uh, make sure that we keep everyone safe and all. And then as the kids and their families come in, you know, they they never come in contact with any of the staff members. They pull up, uh, pop the trunk, we put the food in, they move on. So we, we recognize that. We know that that is a big thing. That's a top priority that we have as we continue to serve all the families. Safety is important. And then as we looked at that, I even, uh, ask Allie to break it down even further for me. Hey, what did we do this week uh, in, in those different sites? Uh, the food truck at the Federal Public uh, Library served 750 meals this week. Owl Creek served, listen to this, 2,485 meals this week. Asbel 885, Butterfield 1,385, Happy Holly 1,395, and then also we have a partnership. Melissa, want to say thank you. You know, we knew that uh, uh, there were other families that we need to serve. We, uh, uh, the housing authority came to us and said, hey, could we make some provision that we can uh, serve those families? And we did. So we provided 350 meals for them, uh, knowing that, that some of them could not come to the different sites. So we feel proud of, uh, of this uh, program, what we're doing. And we got a good recognition from, this, from the uh, uh, state and nutrition departments, hey, job well done, continue doing what you're doing. And, and what really made me feel good is when she says, you know, we appreciate Fedville because Fedville is a model program and we always uh, refer other districts to Fedville. So we really appreciate that piece. And of course, can we improve? Yes. Is there room in, for improvement? Yes. But we, uh, they encourage us to continue to work out, uh, uh, reach out to the different organizations that we do because the program is more than just feeding right now, but it's equipping, equipping parents and families how to access the different resources within Fayetteville. And we have a lot of resources. We wanna make sure we share that with them. So therefore we utilize our Outback program where we have our social workers and they do a great job reaching out to the different families to make sure that their needs have been met. So kudos to all the staff for a job well done. We continue to work this program throughout the month of July uh, to making sure that we're meeting the needs of those families who are in need of, uh, of, of a, a nutritious meal. So we will continue to do that piece. And then the last group I'd like to recognize is uh, our maintenance group. You know, they have been very busy uh, the entire time of working and trying to make sure the buildings are uh, well kept and all. And, you know, we have a cycle that you all approve that we uh, go ahead and upgrade the different parking lots and also the air conditions and all. So this year, um, Asbel, Butterfield, FHS, Holcomb, and uh, McNair will be getting their uh, parking lot resurfaced. And, and I went over to the high school, man, it really looks good out there. So, cause you know, we've been having a lot of uh, bumps and holes in the, in the pavement. So now those schools will have a new, um, parking lot uh, uh, that's been resurfaced. So we appreciate the maintenance for doing a great job. And then we had two buildings that had some leaking. And so with the gyms at Holcomb and Vandegrift, they will receive a, 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 a totally resurfaced of their roof so that they can stop the leaking in the gyms there. So we feel very proud of the work that the uh, maintenance people are doing. We uh, appreciate them. They're working hard every day. So uh, Ms. Wexman, a lot of things are happening in, in the federal public school system, trying to make sure that the buildings and everything is top notch so that when we reopen in August, that the uh, buildings will be ready for our students. So thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Colbert. I think those are all really important um, people to recognize and, um, considering how different their work has been over the last several months and the way they've risen to the challenge. It's, um, it's hard to uh, thank them enough. I think I know we've, we've given them a few shout outs, but um, we're just so grateful for the way they've taken care of the families in this district. Um, any other questions or comments for Dr. Colbert? Um, if not, 
We will move on to the consent agenda now, as opposed to before. Um, and I just wanted you guys to notice there are a couple things on here that we have seen um, already a couple of times as new business and then as old business, but we put them uh, for specifically the, the sign contract for the land purchase um, on Rupal Road and then the contracts for the architects and the construction managers for um, the projects, the, the new school and the uh, athletic facilities at the high school. So um, we, we will still entertain a motion to approve all of these items on the consent agenda unless you have questions or comments about any of those that we'd like to pull out um, and discuss. Anyone? Otherwise, I'll accept a motion to approve. Nika, I'd make the motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, we have a motion from Justin. I'll second. Who was that? Tracy. Tracy, um, yes. <laughs> We have a motion from Tracy and or we have a motion from Justin and a second from Tracy. Um, is there any discussion by the board of these consent agenda items? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, okay, we're well, moving on to presentations. We have a series of presentations for us this evening. I think we've got four. Uh, the first one has to do with the new child nutrition and transportation building. And I believe we have Dr. Slocum here to share that information with us and that plan. Right? And just as a reminder before she gets started, this is a project that I believe we, we approved back in October, right, Dr. Slogan? Yes. So we've just run into a couple of little hurdles, um, but we're still moving forward with that. We are, yes, ma'am. We were also working around the end of school uh, yeah. to try to coordinate that because we were going to be tearing up uh, most of the bus transportation parking lot, and there is no good time to, to do that when you're running... 55 routes every morning and every afternoon. It's a high traffic area all the time. But the good news is we're making great strides on that. Ms. Parker, are you able to click on the attachment? And what this attachment is gonna show you is just to give you an overview of what the building looks like in terms of just the aesthetics. And just as a reminder, we were working to create a, a new office location. This is an office location where our drivers are going to be, have a place to use the restroom. Our child nutrition office will have uh, restrooms available also. Thank you, Ms. Parker. So what you're looking at, if you look on the right side of your screen, you're going to see what that office building looks like. That's child nutrition and transportation. And we found that it would be most cost efficient to combine those two groups together and allow them to share some of those same common areas. And the nice part about this is the ebb and flow of those two groups really coordinates well together. So our, our bus traffic is really heavy early in the morning and kind of dissipates about the time that the child nutrition staff is coming in. And then as child nutrition is, is leaving after lunch, our bus transportation is, is picking back up to get ready for afternoon routes. So we will have offices in this building. We will have a common break room, a common area for training, which is the first time they've had that. And then also uh, good bathroom facilities for everybody to use. What you're gonna notice that kind of stair steps down to the side, that is a partially covered walkway that, now, that will now connect the new child nutrition transportation building to the new to the warehouse. And just as a reminder, as part of this project, we are reskinning the envelope of that warehouse and we're working on that now, along with um, conditioning that space. So we will be able to have 
uh, good heat and air happening in that space, and then that partially covered walkway that will allow um, Ms. Moracek and her staff to go back and forth in between the warehouse, which happens on a regular basis. This will also connect the back parking lot of this particular new building to the, the transportation yard where all of our buses will be. And so they will have a nice paved area to come in and out, uh, which will also be uh, a very welcome for our drivers. So any questions that you have on this facility? We're, we're excited. We have a, a delivery date looking like we'll be hopefully in November. Again, that time frame changes somewhat depending on what the weather does for us in this, uh, in between now and, and that time. Oh, I wasn't thinking. Thank you, Dr. Slocum. So Thank you. you're, you're starting on that project now, but you anticipate being done by November? And we started, yes, ma'am. So we were able to begin uh, shortly after the pandemic uh, to begin progress and making progress and we may try to make good use of that time. You also notice a phasing map and that's just for your reference uh, for you to know kind of where we're working at what dates and at what point. Thank you. One question. Um, we might have discussed this before, but um, so is it are, are they uh, the workers there um, not able to use the existing offices? Are they are they using a different? Are they off working out of a different place temporarily? I'm just curious where they rotated to. Yes. Thinking about all available facilities for this coming fall a little bit, and just one curious where they ended up. Yes, sir. We're, we're being very creative. So uh, uh, some of the transportation staff has been in the break room at the maintenance building. Uh, we will be transitioning the rest of the transportation staff that comes on board on July 1st. They will be um, housed at the Glass Slipper, which is our prom dress location for students. So we are going to be moving prom dresses out and jewelry out and shoes out and be moving uh, a large crew of, of pro predominantly men into a hot pink space. And then we are going to be moving uh, child nutrition is set up over in one of the Jeffer at the Jefferson building with adult education. So um, everybody's been really kind to accommodate the space and accommodate uh, the changes on the in-between time. And we are um, all just working as a team to get it done. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any more, any more questions for Dr. Slocum? Thank you for your hard work on this and all the other projects that you, all the other plates you have spinning in the air, so. We love it. Thank you for letting us do it. Okay, um, we are moving on to, we have an update uh, with regard to our one-to-one -one technology initiative. Yes, ma'am. And again, we gave some props when we started, uh, President Waitsman, to our cafeteria staff and our maintenance staff and our tech staff has been right there with them. Uh, all of the devices going out and as you can imagine, crafting that process and getting 10,500 sent home and collected. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hatch, but just wanted to give kudos to him and his team for all of their hard work. And um, I would love to say that the work is going to get easier, but now we're going to be able to collect all those, clean them, repair them, and get them pushed right back out. So Mr. Hatch, thank you, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the kind words, Dr. Slocum. I appreciate that. Um, so it's been an interesting, uh, tr so as everybody knows, uh, 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 change in, in uh, education typically happens in a pretty slow and consistent way, as it should be. But when you have the disruption that we've seen with AMI, we've seen some pretty revolutionary transformation in the teacher adoption of digital tools. So what, what I'm really gonna say is we couldn't have gone one-to-one -one at our high school at a better time because I don't know how we would have made it through without it this year. So it was just perfect timing for us. So that was really super helpful. Um, Ms. Parker, if you could go to the next slide for me. Um, so this basically kind of talks about how we got to one-to-one -to -one at the high school. We really we really talked about it at the leadership level, determined why it made sense. We had good leadership at the high school itself that really wanted to, that had seen the vision and knew where it could take us. So we made a plan, you know, we created a handbook for students. We're working on adjusting that handbook today, uh, this for, for the 2021 school year. 
Um, we're going to deliver that handbook digitally. We're going to we're going to collect information digitally at the Bulldog Blitz. So we've we've learned how to better do all of those things. And we even got the high school students to help us put together best care practices. And that's always a good thing to have that student voice in there. Um, because as you know, students will listen to each other a lot more than they're going to listen to me. Um, and so we, we went one to one at the high school. And, and I think I really feel it was pretty good success. We didn't have a lot of loss or breakage. I mean, there was there's always a little bit and you can always expect for that. But we, we really seem to do pretty well. And then as we promised, the seniors got to take their devices when they left. So they've got that leg up on having a device they can use uh, to help them further their educational career as they move on. And we have ordered the um, devices for the incoming freshmen. Now, uh, I will say that uh, that the supply chains in the, the world in, in the world have been really disrupted by all of this um, uh, pandemic, and so the the lead times on these devices uh, are a little worrisome. I've got um, my folks at Dell and my folks that I have in contact with at Google trying to help us push those down, but we may not, and I'm just as a may, we may not have them for the first day of school. Um, but we're going to talk about what, I'll, I'll point a couple of things out that'll help us uh, make sure we can take care of kids the first day they come back, uh, regardless if we have exactly the device we need at that time. And, and even if we, we don't get them until um, into September, you know, we will we'll have a plan in place to take care of that. Ms. Parker, if you go to the next slide for me, please. Um, so as we move into the future, I work with Dr. Weaver and Mr. McFetridge to make sure that we've got our tech mission and vision in line with our curriculum mission and vision. That's always really important to me. Um, we're gonna, we are going to get to one-to-one -one with Chromebooks K-12. We believe we're gonna get there this year as long as our, our devices that we've ordered come in. <laughs> Uh, and there's no further disruption in those supply chains. Um, and with regards to, to, to that build out, we are going to continue to work on uh, upgrading our network infrastructure, making sure our wireless is up to snuff. We've got a few, few buildings that we've got some work to do this summer on, and we knew that was going to happen, and we've been, we've been planning for that. And we've also been working on better cloud-based support tools. So if we have to go into a... Um, home environment again, we're going to be better prepared for some of those devices. And what I mean by that is, is um, we were pretty well prepared. I feel like we did pretty good, but I just think we could do a little bit better. There's some things we could do that a little bit different uh, that would help us with that. So we're, we've, we're, we're working on those things as well. Ms. Parker, if you go to the next slide for me. Um, this is a big chunk of data, so I'm not going to show you this. I'm just saying, here's what we're going to talk about. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, so this is where we are. This is where we were as, as of March. So right before we got out, uh, right before AMI kind of shut down. And on the far uh, um, uh, right, that is our percentage of Chromebooks that are in each of these buildings. On the far left, that's the number of iPads that are in the buildings, excluding iPads and ones and twos. And this is important because the iPad one and, one and twos are no longer supported by the majority of our vendors. And this is only uh, really, a, it, it, the majority effect of this is in K4 because of certain tools. They, I'm just pointing that out. So if you take into account the iPads we have in the buildings and the number of Chromebooks, we definitely have the technology in place we need to at least have some digital instruction. And if we have to um, go one-to-one -one at home again and we don't have replacement Chromebooks come in, we can we can rely on those iPads. So that, that, that would be a contingency plan should we need to get there. But that said, we really want our K4s uh, to be one-to-one -one with those Chromebooks. Um, and so we've got some work to do there. So you see on the far right, that's our percentages that have Chromebooks one-to-one. -one. If, you, if you add the iPads and the Chromebooks together, we're, we're pretty much over that almost everywhere. And if not, we could probably move some around. Uh, and Ms. Parker, if you go to the next slide. Another thing to point out is that some of our schools uh, don't assign devices to kids, they assign them to classrooms. And what's important about that is we have more seats than we have kids in a lot of the schools. And so we actually have more devices than kids in a number of our schools. So that's another contingency we could revisit. Maybe we assigned it. So High, Fayetteville High School, we went one-to-one -one devices 
kids own them, they carry them around. Most of our other schools, they're one-to-one, -one, but they rely on classroom sets and computers and the kids get them out when they get in there. Two big problems with that. First one I've already talked about, um, that you have to have more devices than you have kids because of the seat time, the, the seats versus kids thing. And the second thing is we're instructed not to share devices. And if we have to share devices, we have to clean them in between sharing. So, so obviously it makes sense. We probably want to assign the devices to kids. So we're having those conversations right now with the principals. I will say we have one, uh, 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 Holt Middle School does one-to-one. -one. The kids check them out in the morning, check them in in the afternoon, but they don't take them home. So, so there is a model for that. And I think that we can figure that one out. So that's that data. And then uh, go on to the last slide, Ms. Parker. You'll see that if you put all this together, uh, we need about 644 Chromebooks to actually get all of our schools K through 12, uh, one to one. And we have ordered those. And like I said, the lead times of those are out a little bit, but we hope to have them uh, uh, sooner rather than later with the, the support of my contacts at both Google and Dell. So it, that's kind of a broad overview. I, I went a little bit quick through it, but I wanted to make sure I got uh, the information in front of you and I had a little bit of time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions for me. I wasn't on mute the whole time, was I? No, no, you were. No, thank you. Thank you, Eric. That's, yeah, you're that's welcome. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, I don't know how to do that little clappy thing that Dr. Slogan did, but I would if I could. But um, I appreciate that. I think it's just really important to have a picture of that um, going into this, you know, this back to school, the reopening conversation that we're having. So I appreciate Absolutely. I'm, I'm just curious how you actually know those numbers, because it seems to me like it's, it'd be super easy how to uh, lose track of exactly how many. Um, our um, client services team, I, I, couldn't, I can't say enough good things about them. Jamie Wilson and Preston uh, Griffith, they are awesome. And then they, we work with our building techs, our, TI, our we call them technology integration specialists, and they maintain most of our building inventory for us. And you think a, an idea of, of technology inventory is kind of a mundane thing, but it's one of the most important things I need to know in order to make high level decisions about where we put stuff and how we're going to order stuff. So that's what we know. Now, keep in mind, we've sent a lot of devices home and we know some of those devices aren't coming back. Uh, or let me, let me rephrase that. We hope all of the devices come back. We know some of them may come back and need a little bit of work and we're prepping for that. And my client services team is, does amazing repairs on these devices. You think these Chromebooks, you think if they come back and you think there's no way and they they, they fix them. They're, they're an amazing team. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about them. But yeah, they, they, we have a, we just have a team in place that really knows what I need, and that's and part of that is the inventory. Okay, thank you for that. Anybody else have questions for Mr. Hatch? No. Okay. Thanks. Well, there, we may have questions that come up as we hear later from uh, Dr. Weaver with regard to the Ready for Learning Task Force. I don't know, but um, so we'll call on you if we need something. All right. Um, but speaking of Dr. Weaver, we uh, have two reports from you, the first being curriculum review cycle update. Right? Good evening. We're going to go ahead and go into the presentation. There are some links there for the public and for the board. And one of the links is a national podcast that was done and that featured the board approved curriculum review cycle. I was interviewed and I was asked about Fayetteville Public Schools. And our first group ever was the math task force. And that group really set the tone for the rest of the groups because now when they say, what do we do? What does the end product look like? They have what the math task force did on the website. So we're very proud of the math task force and those teachers have set the bar high for future groups. So if you haven't ever heard this podcast, it's available online and it's there in the board docs for the board and for the community. But we're very proud of our teacher leaders. And that's just one example of how the board approved curriculum review cycle has received state and national recognition since we began this in 2017. And now we'll move into the slides.
I feel fortunate to work with Fayetteville Public Schools in a district that allows me to work with teacher leaders because they know the curriculum. It, it would be really easy to just have three or four people sit in an office and write math or write science curriculum. But when you get 40 to 60 teacher leaders together, there's a lot of energy in that group. So I've been asked this evening to provide an update of where we started and the future of the task force and where we believe we're headed as a school district. Once again, the board approved this process and we implemented it with math in 2017-18. After a full review, then we go to the board and we ask for permission to implement the written curriculum written by Fayetteville teachers for Fayetteville teachers. As you can tell, we've, we've accomplished quite a bit since 2017 and this evening, I will be providing an update on the English language arts and the world languages task forces as they finish their work this year. All, both of those involve teachers from Fayetteville Public Schools and we'll share more about that complete, completed work this year. These are some broad goals. Obviously, when we get into English or into world languages, we'll have specific goals and we'll have national programs such as the National Council of Teachers of English or the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and we'll look at national documents. But our teacher leaders want to design a guaranteed curriculum. And that's something that's very important to teachers is knowing the starting point, knowing when we hire new teachers every summer, a principal can give that new teacher the local curriculum and say, this is aligned to the state standards and this is what we teach each quarter. Teachers also want flexibility, but they wanna know what the fate of public school's goals are. So one of our goals as a district is to develop a culturally relevant curriculum. And that's what the English language arts teachers attempted to do. Emerging themes across state and national groups and establish learner outcomes. This will be critically important this year if any school district in Arkansas has to pivot or shift from classroom teaching to online learning, the, the local curriculum will guide decisions about teaching and learning. And then finally, establish program goals. You can have all the curriculum you want, but if you don't have a goal of what you're trying to achieve as an English department or as a Spanish or French department, then it's hard to know if you're really getting closer to your goal. So the teachers identify goals and then they work towards those goals and they also use student data to see if the written curriculum is impacting the understood curriculum. Ms. Parker, we're ready for the next slide. Thank you. Michelle Hayward, our executive director for elementary and middle schools, worked with pre-K through sixth grade, actually pre-K through fourth grade teachers this year. We, this is a shift. We normally have all of the teachers in one room working together, but this year with RISE Reading, which stands for Reading Initiative for Student Excellence, the RISE Reading Program is a statewide initiative to work on reading instruction across the state and to get more consistent reading instruction in Arkansas. RISE Reading is something that our teachers have had extensive training on K through 12, and I know that you've heard about RISE Reading but it's really a, a shift in how reading instruction happens in our district and in our state. And we've had quite a bit of help from our, our four RISE reading um, coaches who work with um, teachers and provide training for our teachers. So this year with RISE reading, we, we took a pause and we took a different direction. Ms. Hayward has said that the document materials would come at a later date. Part of that was because the State Department came out with new guidelines saying that there would be state approved lists and these lists would outline which resources are recommended by the Arkansas Division of Elementary and Secondary Education. This list is just recently this spring during the school closings come out for K-2. So Ms. Hayward and Dr. Nander Campbell and other district leaders got together a group of teacher leaders online and the state had reviewed the materials quite a bit already and they were able to continue that review at the local level virtually and through Zoom meetings and make recommendations to Glenda Solens in our finance office for next steps and purchasing of materials for English language arts. We didn't get to do that yet for third through fifth grade and that would be the next step for third through fifth grade is to review and adopt the materials because that list has recently come out by the State Department of Education. 
need to have ongoing professional development for our English language arts teachers because this was paused due to COVID-19 and school closings. We also need to develop the website for English language arts teachers for pre-K through 12, and that will be coming. We're actually working on that right now in, in the months of June and July, and we'll have that ready before the school year starts. But normally at this presentation for our two new board members, I would be presenting the, the English curriculum that the teachers wrote, but due to school closings, we don't have that ready to present tonight, but we did want to let you know that we completed the board approved curriculum review cycle for English language arts. And we will come back to the board with that curriculum. Next slide, please. I'm going to shift now to talk about world languages. In world languages, we just lost a teacher. I got an email this week from a teacher, a really good friend of mine who's worked in the district for a long time, a veteran teacher who said, I've, I've accepted a job, a new opportunity to be in, a, in an academic coaching role in another school district. And we hate to lose great teachers, but without the board approved curriculum review cycle, this teacher would have left and we wouldn't have had all of her years of experience and all of her resources and once again, she's the leader in our district. And this is just an example that sometimes when people leave, they leave something for the next teacher that takes their classroom. So I left her a note and said, when you left, you left us a legacy of your years of experience and your research and your created materials. And you also left that for whoever's taken your new classroom. So that's, it's bittersweet to lose great teachers, but it's also great to see people who leave, leave behind something for the next generation of teachers really proud of this group. You may not know, or you may know, we have German, French, and Spanish. And those are the three languages that we currently offer. We offer it in junior high and high school at Fayetteville Public Schools. These teachers came together, they developed a curriculum, and they, they fell just short of being, their final meeting was cut short due to school closings. But via Zoom, they were able to come together and they had already reviewed all of the materials. They actually had a meeting to review the materials in person and they just didn't get to have a final vote. So they placed their final vote. Their department chair and another teacher met with me and Glenda Solons and Jennifer Brand. And when we met, they were able to place their orders and Ms. Solons is currently working with companies to get those materials here, hopefully for the beginning of this school year. And once again, they have a finished curriculum, but we don't have the website developed to where it's organized. So we would like to bring this back to the board. We're very proud of the work of the World Languages teachers this year and all they've accomplished. Ms. Parker, next slide, please. One thing I failed to mention about the English language arts teachers is we had our past two Fayetteville Public Schools Teachers of the Year on that committee, one from the high school and one from Woodland Junior High. So when you have your teacher of the year for the two in a row on a committee, you can see the strength in the board approved curriculum review cycle. The strength is not in me as a facilitator. The strength is not in the document. The strength is in the process and having other teachers being able to be around your district teacher of the year. So having two in the same group was, was pretty unique. For our new board members, this is something that we've used with every group, starting with the math task force. Stage one, we determine the goals, and those are the goals of the program. We unpack the state standards and decide what every student should know and be able to do. And then we evaluate our current curriculum to see if what's working and what's not working. And in stage three, we begin to revise and write curriculum for areas where we have gaps. And by the time we get to stage four, we're ready for materials review and adoptions. So really the reason I wanted to share this visual with the board this evening is to let you see that we made it through stages one through three with English language arts. And with the exception of K2 English language arts, we need to finish stage four, and then we will complete the curriculum review cycle for English language arts. With world languages, we completed the entire cycle and underneath you see it's just a main focus on continuous improvement. We want to get better every year and we want to get better through this review process, just like a business would review the strengths and weaknesses of their business. We want to review the strengths and weaknesses of our programs. So very proud of the teacher leaders who served this year. We're ready for the next slide. 
We worked with the University of Arkansas this year, Dr. Chris Gearing. We partnered with him and he worked with us and he was able to connect us with people with the National Council of Teachers of English, with some of the board members for NCTE, with university professors and curriculum designers. And we would have Zoom meetings and we would, we would bring in these guest speakers to speak with our teacher leaders. And then we would have a Q&A and they would push our thinking on um, current practices at the national level for English language arts. So I'd just like to mention our, our appreciation for Dr. Gearing and the University of Arkansas for the partnership we had with them with English language arts. At this time, I'd like to discuss the future of the board approved curriculum review cycle. And I'd like to respectfully ask the board to consider a request or a proposal. I would like to come to you this evening and propose that we pause the curriculum review cycle for one year. And I ask this respectfully because I realize that your review cycle that you asked me to lead and facilitate. Some of the reasons I'm asking for this tonight, and I don't know that we need to take a vote in public, but the reasons I'm proposing and asking this for the board to consider is because when we return to school, we need all of our teachers in the classroom. We've already missed so much school this spring that to pull teachers out of the classroom and have substitute teachers would be difficult on our students when, when they have a lot to catch up on. We also realize that's difficult on our teachers. It was already hard enough during, during previous years to pull teachers out eight to 10 times, but to do it during this coming school year would be a challenge for any school district. We also know that when we take teachers out, we have to have substitute teachers and finding additional substitute teachers this year may be a challenge in the beginning of the school year. So there are several other reasons that I've listed in a letter to the board and to the board chair, um, Nika Waitsman. And I'd just like to, to respectfully consider this as a request. And if you ask that we continue to move forward with the board approved curriculum review cycle this year, we will. But if you say we can pause, this will allow us to delay social studies, which was already on delay because the State Department of Education is making some changes. The only one that we would really pause this year would be health and PE teachers and their curriculum. Ms. Parker, I'm ready for the next slide. Yes, if you could click on that, please. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Board members, this is a different review cycle than the one that's posted on the Fayetteville Public Schools website. This review cycle shows my proposal to the board. We would skip this year or pause this year, and that would give us more time to finish the work of the English language arts with some of the materials review and would help us implement some of the math and science. Some of the elementary teachers were already asking last year, could we, could we slow it down because we had math and science and then this year English language arts and it seemed a lot if you teach all of those subjects to implement something new every year. So that's another reason for the request. But this just shows that beginning in 2021-22, we were to re renew the same cycle, beginning with social studies teachers and health and PE teachers, both pre-K through 12, and then visual arts and career and technical education the following year. And in 2023-24, we would review ACT, SAT prep and our performing arts. And so that's the proposal, the pause, and this is a visual to show you how it would impact Fayetteville Public Schools. Ms. Parker, I'm ready for the next slide. Once again, I'd like to thank all of the teacher leaders. Normally under normal board circumstances, we're able to bring about 10 to 15 teachers from each task force and let them be recognized before the board. But if they're out there watching tonight, I'd like to thank them for all they did for Fayetteville Public Schools and all they have done to make their program better for students and for teachers who come after them in their classroom. But we're really proud of the teacher leaders and we're really proud to work in Fayetteville Public Schools where this board allows teacher leaders to review and develop curriculum and the continuous improvement cycle just makes it better for students. Ms. Waitsman, I'm ready for questions at this time, if there's any questions or discussion from the board. Okay, thank you, Dr. Weber. Um, this is not a, a new business item, uh, but it does require some feedback from the board with regard to 
um, any concerns or that we may want to express at this time or or if there's a comfort level, I think, you know, we did approve this curriculum review cycle um, a few years ago, but we didn't necessarily um, determine the specifications of it. I think there was still, you know, some um, administrative decision making to do within that. It was more just a charge that we um, instigated and also included in our strategic plan. So it's not necessary to vote on, on a change as long as we continue to move forward with the, uh, with the curriculum review. But still, does anyone have any concerns or questions about this proposed adjustment? Uh, Nika, if, oh. um, if you're just looking for consensus, uh, I, would, I certainly would, uh, would support the, um, uh, the pause on the, on, in the cycle. Uh, given the uh, challenges that um, Dr. Weber mentioned that we all know are ahead of us. Okay. Same here, Nika, I would as well, I would echo Tim's comments and we've had to make some changes on the fly uh, from recommendations from Dr. Weber and um, Dr. Colbert in the, in, the, in the past and we've always uh, uh, rolled with those, uh, with those changes and, and this is no different in my view. Mm -hmm. I think it's an understandable um, revision of, I think we're just having to revise a lot of things to that point, Justin. Megan, you had a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna say that I, I really appreciate, um, not, not just because of the pandemic, but just because of where we are, I, I feel like it will be nice to have teachers in classrooms, um, especially teacher leaders in classrooms with actual kids. Um, I think that's something that, that the district, I think the curriculum cycle has been great and doing it in-house has been great, but I think a moment to, to regroup from that will also be important. I also think um, social studies is up next, right? Social I mean, we have studies to and health and PE. Yeah, and I feel like, um, I don't know about the rest of the board, but I've gotten a lot of feedback around, um, just curiosity around where our social studies curriculum is. Um, and I feel like it will be good to have some time, especially given everything else that's going on to, to have our feet under us and to have considered, not all the way under us, but like to have considered those questions and to be able to have some community conversation around that to see where that leads us before we um, start to solidify conversation. I mean, I think there's a lot of national conversation around social studies curriculum and not jumping right into that in August, I think. Um, gives teachers an opportunity to experiment and to learn. And I, I, just, I think it can go to good places. That's all. I think it's not unlike the conversation we're having about our you know, strategic planning uh, calendar as we're just re-identifying some more urgent concerns and trying to uh, provide space and focus for those things so that we can do those well over the coming months. Um, not necessarily setting aside all of that, we need to keep an eye on it, but I agree there's just more pressing um, needs at this time. So I'm comfortable with it as well. Um, any other comments or concerns? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Um, we'll just uh, make the assumption you'll you'll make that revision, and uh, we'll hear from you again in several months. Hopefully, the dust has settled a little bit at that point. But um, but actually, we'll hear from you again right now with regard to <laughs> the task force. Thank you, Ms. Weitzman, and members of the board. We are very excited about this next topic. This is the Ready for Learning Committee for Fayetteville Public Schools that Dr. Colbert referenced in his remarks earlier in the board meeting. Earlier this year, Dr. Colbert asked me, and this was, this was towards the end of the school year, the final weeks of the school year, he asked me to form a committee. And he asked me to form a committee of parents, classified staff, and certified staff. We also asked each of the PPC and the Fayetteville Education Association, each of those three groups to nominate a representative to serve on this committee. So we'll start with the first slide. 
The purpose of the committee, as Dr. Colbert charged me, was to work together with parents and classified and certified staff to identify issues related to three stages, the beginning of the school year, or actually the beginning of COVID-19 around March 15th to the end of March, the middle, which was the fourth quarter, and when we got into grading and we got into parent communication and attendance and Zoom meetings with students, and then the closing, which we haven't got to yet. So predicting back to school would be hopefully, we know it's not a closing of COVID-19 because we don't have a cure yet in the United States and in the world, but the closing would be the return to school and reopening of school. And what recommendations do these three groups have for Fayetteville Public Schools? Ms. Parker, I'm ready for the next slide, thank you. As I mentioned, parents classified and certified staff went through these three stages and the next slide will define how we set up the focus groups. We don't need to click on this slide, but anyone in the community watching or board members, if you'd like to know who served on the committee and which school they represented, you can click on this link at a later date and you can see the members of the Fayetteville Public Schools Ready for Learning Committee. Tonight, I'm very honored to have with us Ashley Roche, incoming uh, PTO president at Vandergriff Elementary, Dr. Stephanie Adams, parent at Ramey Junior High, Katie Jackson has had kids throughout our school district, but she's currently a parent at Fayetteville High School. And we also have two teacher representatives with us tonight. On the next slide, we're very honored tonight to have with us Leanna Jackson, a teacher at Washington Elementary, and Kylie Luton, an Owl Creek Middle School teacher. Very happy to have these uh, guests with us. Uh, Ms. Waitsman and Dr. Colbert invited these guests and would like to just hear from them. They're representing their school community, but they're also representing themselves. So they're here tonight to share a little bit about three questions that I have, and they won't all answer the same questions. We've, we've already organized and divided up the questions that they're going to answer. So if we'll go to the next slide, we'll, we'll hear from some of our teachers and parents that were on the Fayetteville Public Schools Ready for Learning Committee. Our first question, and we'll hear from two people in our group on this question, what is one question or issue that came out of your focus group and we'll go to our first person. All right, good afternoon or good evening, um, school board and superintendent, Dr. Colbert and Dr. Weber. Thank you guys for allowing me to be here um, and um, I offer my insight and um, just speak for us teachers for Fable Public Schools. I'm super nervous, but super excited to be here. Um, so one of the questions um, that came out of the focus group that I was in was how are we going to support our students um, and bridge the gap between um, the school and families, specifically more so for our vulnerable families. Um, when we think about technology usage and family engagement, um, how can we get our families uh, trained with technology usage so that they can help their students with um, their education and learning and academics. Um, so that was one of the questions that I brought from, from the support group. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. We'll come back to you for the third question as well. We're going to go now to one of our parents. Hi, I second what Leanna said. Thank you for having us and for allowing us to speak um, to what we experience in our focus groups. Um, as a mom of a going to be third grader and then an incoming kindergartner, one of the things that we talked a lot about is what realistically it looks like for kids in elementary school to wear masks all day. And obviously health and safety of the faculty and staff and students is the most important part but also to think that as with a kindergartner coming in, we don't want the joy to be sucked out of it all. If they're wearing a mask, looking at teachers with masks, I just feel like we got to think about, think that completely through. And we talked a lot about that in our focus group as well. The mental and social aspect also. Thank you. Ms. Parker, we're ready for the next question. And as Ms. Parker goes to the next slide, 
the, re- the way we set this up due to social distancing was via Zoom. It seems like everything's via Zoom nowadays. So Dr. Kelly Dugan, um, our Director of Assessment and Research and Accountability, she put together Zoom breakout rooms. And so rather than having 30 or 40 people all in one meeting, we wanted each voice to be represented in each group. We had about four people in a group and we utilized principals, assistant principals and directors to facilitate each group. So each group had a facilitator and a note taker. And then we had four people in the group giving answers. And so everybody had a chance to speak. We had probably 70 to 80 pages of notes combined. And then Dr. Dugan summarized all of that. And I'll be sharing the summary tonight from the Ready for Learning Committee with the board. At this time, we're gonna move to our next question. What was your overall experience with AMI lessons? Hi, I'm Kylie Luton. So I teach fifth grade math and um, my overall experience with the AMI lessons was that the students who were actively participating and went really well, it was difficult um, moving, moving forward from when we went from the paper packets to the PBS lessons. And then when we made our teacher lessons to get students to make sure that they had all of the needs, um, their technology or internet um, access. So after they got on board with all of that, it, it seemed to go well, but we didn't have a ton of students um, working with us on the Zooms for the most part of it. It, it, didn't, it took a lot of work to get all of those students to be, be on board with us. Dr. Adams informed me that she had another professional meeting to attend tonight that started at six. So she was going to hang in with us as long as she could, but I think she had to go to her other meeting this evening. So at this time, before we go to the next question, I want to ask any of our three parents, if you would like to share what was from a parent lens, what was your experience with AMI lessons? Because we know it's different in every family. So any of our three parents are welcome to answer this question. Um, I, I have three children that currently go to Fayetteville Public Schools. I have one who's in third grade at Washington, one who is in, he's going to be in sixth grade, I guess, at um, Ramey, or just kidding, Owl Creek. And then I have one eighth grader who's going to um, Ramey. And so I have to say that having three children, um, three different types of platforms and communicating with teachers um, three different types of expectations from different teachers. It was very overwhelming as a parent, making sure that I was getting all of the expectations met that were um, requested of me from the different teachers. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. That's something we forget sometimes is that AMI lessons are hard for all parents, but our teachers are at home teaching everyone else's children and they have two or three kids of their own. Any other parent that would like to answer this question? I think you're pausing because I didn't prep you for this, but if any other parent would like to chime in, we'd love to hear the parent perspective. There may be some board members that could chime in too about their parent perspective of AMI learning or not. I, I did have one more perspective and it wasn't actually my perspective, but a perspective from um, a family who was, um, had older students and these were families who uh, specifically dropped out of high school, parents did, and so they did not have the educational level to be able to help their students with um, being able to um, uh, complete some of the schoolwork that was required of them. And so that was very hard on some of the families as well. Yeah, I would, I would second what uh, Leanna just said. Um, I think like, so I, I have lots of people who contacted me during, during the end of the year for even elementary school math, just because the way that math is taught now, for example, is so different from how we learned it. Like what a 10 set is. I mean, I think, I think common core math is wonderful. I think it creates a, uh, um, uh, like a math literacy that that many of us don't have, but knowing knowing how to do that, like we're not we're not carrying 
carrying numbers anymore and, and teaching kids at home how to, how to do that. Um, I, I just, I'm looking forward to next year for a number of reasons with that and our ability to get better at um, at supporting parents who are who are our partners in, in teaching and learning. Um, and I think we need to do that intentionally, um, leaving it to kind of a one-off, like how, how is the teacher gonna wedge in explaining this to a parent? How are we gonna teach parents to advocate for themselves? Like I think saying like overtly, we teach math differently now, like on third, like we're gonna have these times when we can, can walk you through how you do this, um, how you can even have a conversation with your kid at home. And I think that that's one of the opportunities that, that this bizarre situation is offering us to, to learn all kinds of stuff about how to support teaching and learning in a, in a 360 degree way. I don't think that that's just a useful conversation when, um, when kids are stuck at home learning. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, I mean, I think the transition to learning, I know it got hard for my kids to do three months of review. Um, and it will be a different challenge to do new material um, remotely for kids who are, who are gonna continue to learn remotely. Um, so I, I know that that doesn't make it easier, but I, I feel like what we're stepping into in August is, is different in that way and balancing I don't know. We're, we're we're biting off a lot. I I guess that's it, it's it's hard. It's hard. It, it, and and I and I feel like we have so much to say about personalized learning right now, and and we're really gonna get to get to taste what personalized learning feels like on your tongue, you know. So it's gonna be great. Ms. Parker, if you could advance to the next slide. This is our final question for our panelists and each of them are going to have an answer on this one. So what is one recommendation you have for reopening Fayetteville Public Schools? Hi, I'm Katie Jackson and I am a parent. Um, I think that while in our minds we have to be, our theme needs to be flexibility. Um, in reality, we've, the theme has got to be consistency from week to week with schedules and practices and grading and how methods of communication, um, it's got to be consistent. And that was what frustrated most of uh, many people in the spring was it changed from week to week and Zoom times changed from week to week. And, and what was expected from the kids it changed and how the kids were reached. One day it was through a group me text and one day it was through Google Classroom and one day it was, it was just very inconsistent. So whether you're a virtual learner or at school, we've got to be consistent from week to week and be clear with communication to um, the parents and to the students and to the teachers. I just think we've got to be consistent about what's expected, how to turn in work, what the grading is gonna be, what the schedule is gonna be, what our mask policy is gonna be just try to be consistent as possible. And yet we have to have room for flexibility. Um, but I, I, um, I think both ways can work. I think people are gonna be very excited to be vir virtual learners. And I think people are gonna be excited for their children to be in the classroom. So whatever we can do to be consistent in those practices is the best. Um, I think I am up next. Um, I think my one recommendation would be, I mean, I have several, but one would be if we, God forbid, had to um, close schools again for coronavirus, um, if, I don't know if it'll be one person test positive in the school or how that will look, but my suggestion would be that if we do that, then to have the teachers teaching virtually daily. Um, I think that that will help the children and the ones that don't have the parents' involvement and just the structure of um, home life and homeschooling. Hi, so for my recommendation, it would be that whenever we get the information for what the school year is going to look like when we do reopen, that we are able to push that information out to parents and families as soon as possible so that they're able to start talking with their kids about what school is going to look like and what expectations might look like, just so when they come to school that there's not going to be any uncertainty just to go along with the consistency of what the school year is going to look like. Thanks. 
I mean, my recommendation is that we form some sort of a community outreach task form or task force, sorry, um, whose responsibility it is to kind of research some of those best practices in being able to um, get a hold of our all of our families, reach them where they are, pull them up, educate them with technology, um, social emotional resources, just all that. But I feel like ultimately it's going to be a task force that's going to need to come together so that we can make sure that we we get it done. Right. I'm going to continue with the presentation, but I'd like to ask our teachers and parents who represent the committee to stay online because there may be some more questions at the end of the presentation. Ms. Parker, thank you. This is what you will see if you go to the Arkansas Division for Elementary and Secondary Education website. About two weeks ago, superintendents and administrators and teachers across the state attended a webinar called Arkansas Ready for Learning. This looks similar to what the government did with businesses. So Arkansas Ready for Learning is what K-12 education is going by. And the next slide will show you the six systems which are part of this circle. The six systems for Arkansas include number one, academics, and that would fall under the guaranteed and viable curriculum that our teacher leaders create. The second thing in the six systems would be human capital followed by student support and the fourth system is stakeholder. So stakeholder communication, family and community engagement, you've seen this tonight. So academics, we do well with our teachers and their feedback. It's been a little bit challenging not having our teachers on campus or our directors on campus to make decisions, but we did quite well. And I'm proud of our teachers and our families and our parents and guardians for what we accomplished to just complete the school year under very challenging times. But the state wants us to continue working with our stakeholders and family and community engagement. While we're on number four, I wanna also point out that weekly Dr. Slocum and Melissa Thomas have meetings with about 90 health officials from Northwest Arkansas and across the region. They're getting information weekly from doctors and from um, police officers and other health officials. Weekly, Dr. Colbert attends a meeting with Steve Clark in the Chamber of Commerce where he receives regional updates. And so we're connected with the mayor's office and city council and we're connected with these groups who are giving us advice. So it's not just this one group on the Ready for Learning Committee, it's also regional leaders who have expertise outside of education. The next slide talks about system number five and six. District operations and fiscal governance. Obviously, we, we lean heavily on Dr. Tucker and Glenda Solens and her staff. And number six, facilities and transportation, which falls under Dr. Tucker, Mr. McClure, and other staff members who do so much for our students. So how will we get students to and from school? What will car rider and bus rider line look like? These are all things along with academics that the Ready for Learning Committee addressed. Ms. Parker, thank you so much for advancing the slides. We're ready for the next slide. If you could click on this link, please, Ms. Parker. I want to give credit to Dr. Kelly Dugan once again, because she developed this report. Very hard to take all of the different notes from the different focus groups and develop a summary. But that's what she's good at is research and evaluation, and she loves this kind of thing. But Dr. Dugan put together the summary for Fayetteville Public Schools and presented it to Dr. Colbert so we can present it to the board this evening. This will be posted on a website and open for the community to read. You may see a lot of questions and think, well, that, that's not a complete plan. The committee met twice. They had two different meeting dates and all of the committee members were required to come on both dates. Each meeting was about an hour and a half to two hours in length. And we have a lot of questions because a lot of parents and a lot of teachers and classified staff have more questions than answers. I think that's true of our local and state government right now. There are a lot of questions about the next three months. So over the last um, month, under Dr. Colbert's leadership, Fayetteville Public School staff have been trying to identify answers to these questions. And if we didn't have the answer, that's where we went out to our regional uh, leaders and asked for support with things that were outside of academics. So we're working with Mike McClure on transportation. We're working with Eric Hatch on technology and ordering new Chromebooks and devices. 
we're working with all of our associate superintendents. Today we had an executive cabinet meeting and we reviewed this document. And then I wanted to also note that this afternoon before the board meeting, Dr. Colbert released communication to the community and to parents and students. He also released communication to Fayetteville Public School staff. The type of communication that came out today comes from this task force. So a lot of the questions that were raised, that gave us information on what people needed answers to. So I wanna give credit to Alan and Holly who worked with communications and put together communications and Dr. Colbert today delivered the message of next steps for Fayetteville Public Schools. And much of that was based on the questions raised in this report. So if you don't see answers in the report, look at the report and compare it to future communication documents coming out from Fayetteville Public Schools because this group of parent leaders, teacher leaders, and classified staff leaders have helped Fayetteville Public Schools determine the next few months and ready for learning plan. Ms. Parker, thank you for sharing this slide and the um, report. I'm sure we can dig into that deeper and um, we'll go to the next slide. As I've briefly shared this evening, the next steps for Fayetteville Public Schools include the following. Review recommendations made by District Ready for Learning Committee. That's been going on for three to four weeks. Share back to school options for families. That happened today at about 4 p.m. So now this message will get out to our community that students have options. If families decide I wanna keep my child home for the first semester, there will be options for virtual learning for K through 12. If families decide they wanna send their child back to school and we're allowed to open school, which right now we're planning for, we'll be open five days a week and we'll have school at a traditional brick and mortar school. And we'll also have technology at school like we always have. So options are now available and posted online and sent via email to families just this evening. And finally, we will continue the plan, the reopening schools. On September 1st, the reopening schools plan for each school district in Arkansas is due to the State Department. So we will have our plan ready before then because we want to have our plan ready when we reopen schools. And we will continue to work with this committee as Dr. Colbert shared in his remarks earlier this evening. We will continue to add new members as needed. And I want to share that there are a few teachers who were kind of, I don't want to say frustrated, they were just hurt that they weren't included on the committee. And so anytime a teacher has contacted me and said, I don't feel like our group was there. I don't feel like I was there. I wanted to be on the committee. I shared with them to just send me an email or a Google doc with the list of recommendations for libraries or for band rooms or for choir or for PE. And we did have multiple groups represented, but if any individual, whether it's a parent, a community member or a teacher feels like there's something they want Fayetteville Public Schools to hear, if they'll send that to Dr. Colbert or myself, we will add that to the continuing recommendations. And I want to mention that our communications department is sending out information where the public will have a link where they can also, if they don't want to send it directly via email, there will be a link where the public can ask questions because there are a lot of questions right now in our community. And as district leaders, we have questions as well, but we want to hear from our stakeholders and we want to continue to build on the work of the Ready for Learning Committee. So I'll go to the next slide, Ms. Parker. Ms. Waitsman, as we come to the end of this presentation, you can tell these are some of our Fayetteville High School students who recently graduated and they're dissecting. And that's what we continue to do in Fayetteville. It seems like we're dissecting a lot of information and we don't have all the answers. But that, that learning and that inquiry mindset and that adaptability, just like we want our students to be adaptable, as leaders, we're trying to be adaptable and we're trying to dissect as much information as possible to make informed decisions to share with you, the board, and with our families and community and our teachers and staff. And at this time, we're open for questions and have direct questions for the parents or teachers on the committee. Feel free to direct that to them and they'll be happy to answer your questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Weber. The, the one thing I wanted to also mention is um, I think the, you know, there was a window in there where we, our hope was that we could give families a little bit of a breather from all of the chaos that we just came out of, hoping that we could all take a step back and 
um, you know, take a little personal, even though we weren't many of us traveling a little bit of a vacation from all of this craziness. And, um, but we are feeling from our community, this anxiousness to understand what the fall looks like. And I know you guys are trying to respond to that while at the same time, trying to accommodate a little bit of a break from all of that. And I appreciate the way that you have kind of, um, like everything adjusted on the fly to figure out the, the best time to push out that information. I think, you know, for some people, the perception was that um, we, we weren't, we were intentionally, or we were just not doing anything. Um, but the truth was we, we were trying to allow that, that break. And, um, but I also feel like to, I think one of the teachers or parents mentioned earlier that that families are anxious to know what their fall is going to look like. And even though it's a good, I guess, six weeks away, um, there's a, it's understandable why they would want some clarity. So um, I appreciate it. But I know we have a few questions here um, from the board. Does anybody want to chime in? If not, I've got a few questions. <laughs> uh, Nika, this is Tim. Um, yeah, we're looks like we're about seven weeks out. Um, I think a, a concern I would have had is given that there are still a number of unknowns um, and things that we don't yet uh, know what uh, is going to come in terms of directives and guidance out of out of Little Rock, uh, or even just in terms of what the um, uh, the state of public health is come August. Um, I can, I can appreciate that we haven't set in stone a set of plans that uh, we would suddenly have to undo two weeks from now or uh, two weeks from away from opening. So I think um, trying to lay out as much as we can ahead of time as is being communicated uh, today from the district, uh, but also knowing that there are still elements of this that uh, are subject to uh, things beyond our control. But I, I appreciate the people um, parents and staff um, spending a lot of time thinking through and wanting to help us do the very best we can um, in, in a, a challenging situation. And so I, I applaud their, their work and dedication and, and commitment to our students. One other thing I wanted to mention is Dr. Colbert and I have talked about um, going forward for the next several months, however, I mean, no one knows how long anything lasts these days, but that we will be getting regular updates from this, this group. And it'll be an expanded group from what we have right now is my understanding that we're gonna um, add some more voices uh, from the community and maybe from our FPS family that will be providing regular insights to the board as far as, you know, how we're responding to CDC adjustments and guidelines and um, you know the Department of Ed, how they're directing us and how we're responding to that. So that will be something that we can discuss at every board meeting, but obviously this is a this is a bigger conversation right now because we're trying to figure out how to reopen. I have a question, Dr. Weber. Um, um, I, I, in talking to, to teachers, um, I feel like one of the things that is, is a huge asset that we have for, for kids and staff and just the whole community is people's different, different levels of comfort and different things that they bring to the table. Um, and I really, I so appreciate, um, Katie, I can't see your name. I can point you to you on my screen, but you're nodding. You see me. Um, your, your point about consistency, and I, I know how important systems are. Um, I love systems, but I also I'm, I'm really eager to see how we're able to take what different teachers are willing to bring to the table. So I know that, that there are teachers who are like, let's figure out that outdoor classroom business. And I can take a group of 10 out here and we can sit in a field and we can like, and, and, and then there are teachers who are like, I, I would really like to like be in my classroom with like, and just, I, and I feel like, I think we're very likely to find that there are teacher, the kids and families that match right up to those teachers. 
um, and and how we can like I know it's such an unbelievably complicated puzzle, but just how we can put together what what teachers and staff are are ready and willing to bring their creativity, everything that they know about how to how to serve kids, um, and 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 match them with with child and family need. Um, and I I know that that I, I really appreciated Anna's point about how humble we're going to have to be about how we mess up and like stumble as we do this. But I really feel like it's such a worthy. Thing to try to do well to not to like systematize but not like crush um mm -hmm. that i don't yeah uh, so i, I fig figuring out how to how to do that well i'm just i'm so i don't know and, and and also to to all the teachers who spoke at the beginning of this to their point like i i really understand the district's need for flexibility and i also i cannot think of a time when we need the cooperation of educators and PPC and those functioning relationships more. Um, I I haven't looked at all the waivers that we're applying for, and I know that that's a quick turnaround. But I just I feel like anything that we can do to really show how in their corner we are and how desperately we need their expertise and help and trust and like just just how how we can all. I don't know, really, really kind of come together and stitch it together. Um, and, and to do that for, for parents, I just, I don't know. I, I know agree with you. So I agree with you. I think, I think there's a lot of room for creativity. I think there's a lot of room for even the people who are going to the brick and mortar school for that, for a class to go outside, yeah. um, to have a rehearsal outside, to do things different. Um, and yet, uh, it, one of my main frustrations during the spring was not knowing what to expect or when my student needed to be oh, on the Zoom and not on the Zoom and how the, I would say, okay, I know that you have to do this because Google Classroom said this and then the communication came through a group me that said, oh no, we don't have to do this. And I, I just need some consistency. If a teacher wants to do something different, then pick one method of communication and and, and tell everyone that and stick with that method. But I, I need some consistency from week to week of what to expect, whether I'm going to school or whether I'm virtual. But I think it would be great if your teacher, especially an elementary teacher that had more control of her, maybe uh, his or hers classroom, maybe, maybe that person has those students all day. Maybe they could meet somewhere. I think, I think that would be fabulous to meet somewhere and do something. But, um, you know, you have to know that well maybe they also have a music time and maybe they have a library time too so um let's let's start off with some sort of schedule that we can then make creative off of that but i think our teachers are wonderful and i completely support them and their needs and i want to be um, sensitive to what the teachers need to get through this too no that's that's what i hear you saying like i i want i mean i have a rising third grader and rising fifth grader and like we need like one system for communicating. Like I 100% I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, that's, I mean, that's what I, that's what I hear you saying. I feel like there are groups like, um, like English language learners and stuff where you're like, we're just not going to be able to do it unless we really take advantage of, of like creative ways to be together. Yeah. I don't know. Ms. Weitzman, were there other questions from the board? I think Justin has something. I, I just had one thing and, and uh, um, kind of as we go forward with this, as we, we get in, input um, from the task force and we hear from lots of people, and I think we are going to be hearing from lots of people, is how we manage kind of disappointment and things being less than perfect. Um, I mean, I, I think we can safely say just as, as, as a country, we're, we're not managing disappointment um, or things being less than perfect very, very well. Um, and, uh, you know, this is going to be no different. And I think it's to, to Tim's point, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of time between now and the start of school and, and, you know, um, uh, not, not sure what direction, um, uh, th this is going. Um, but I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of inconvenience and a lot of disappointment and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of barriers and a lot, lots of, lots of things that, that we all can, um, gripe about and um you know uh being able to navigate through that and hit on those things that we really need to be 
addressing and, and such things as losing communication with kids, with certain groups of, of, of kids that we may have, um, you know, lost literal touch with, uh, you know, in the last uh, three months of, 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 of school and figuring out how we um, can reconnect and keep connection uh, with them. The communication um, uh, uh, challenges that now have been talked about uh, uh, several times. There's a almost like a whole platform of communication that did not exist. It had to be kind of thrown together in two days. And, um, you know, those things are, are, are very real, um, very real problems. But, um, you know, I, I certainly do foresee in um, a couple of months, uh, the possibility of, of because life is so different in school um, that we are gonna have just a lot of different disappointments because things are different and things aren't the same. And, and um, uh, I think it's gonna be a tough thing uh, to, to manage. And so kind of as we go forward, sort of thought towards that and, and how we're gonna cope with it and, and, um, and, 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 and not just have, you know, it be overwhelming. Um, I think it's gonna be key because there's, there's, there's no getting around um, the, the fact that this is less than ideal. And so um, that would be um, something overall that, that I would be most interested in because we, we gotta make this year as um, uh, productive and, and have as much value as, 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 as we can. So that was my, my thought. Well, I'm, I'm used to uh, disappointing people all the time. So, uh, so you can just uh, blame me if something doesn't quite uh, go as uh, hoped for and expected. But, no, but I do appreciate that, uh, Justin. The, um, uh, we all come in with, with our expectations. And uh, this is one of those situations where um, sometimes from one day to the next, we don't, uh, we don't have the luxury of knowing what to expect. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it just for the sake of uh, reminding myself, I guess that you know we really do uh, have to res be responsive to what directives directives come from uh, the State Department of Education and the Health Department, of course. And um, so some of it is really a lot of hurry, hurry up and wait. Um, but I, I appreciate again that we've got a, a really committed group of uh, folks that I guess are going to get even even larger uh, folks to help us uh, uh, work collaboratively to get all this done. Anyone else? I, I have one um, question, Dr. Weber, and you did kind of touch on this, but um, one thing, or maybe it was one of the teachers or parents, um, I think we're realizing a, a need for real consistent and informative communication. Um, and so I th I'm just hoping that that's one of the big things that's come out of this task force is um, some type of, you know, real structured um, plan for communicating to parents and, and teachers. Yes. That, that wasn't a question, but I am kind of asking, is there a, a plan for that? That was the biggest theme that came from all groups, um, parents and staff, was consistency. Um, you know, sometimes we would start something and three weeks later we would change it. We were almost going week by week in the beginning and then we got good when we were able to plan three or four weeks out, but it, it just hit us so fast like it did the rest of the world that we were making decisions on the fly sometimes. Um, Holly Johnson has done an excellent job with communications and she's, she's learned some lessons. I've learned some lessons from teaching and learning and then we learned sometimes that we had nine elementary schools in some cases giving out information. So, you know, as a district, sometimes we need to have one district message instead of each school having their own message. But to everyone's credit, the principals, the teachers, everyone was just doing the best they could to reach out to families. And sometimes we got accused of over communication and sometimes under communication. But it is something that we've learned from us. I think there's so many lessons learned from a from a tragic time and this was this was just so fast and we had to adapt but now we do have two or three months or we have had time since since the storm or since the calm has hit 
and we are looking to plan for the new school year, but consistency is what Dr. Colbert continues to speak in our executive cabinet meetings. We've got to be consistent because that's what people need during a time like this is consistency during the instability. And he is, um, he's heard from the stakeholders. Ms. Waitsman, I want to, on behalf of Dr. Colbert, thank the, the parents and teachers who took time out of their summer to present at the board meeting tonight via Zoom. And I'd like to also thank all of the committee members from the Fayetteville Public Schools Ready for Learning Committee for their time that they gave to help us get to this point and to help us with today's communication mem memo to staff and families. So on behalf of Dr. Colbert and the board, thank you for helping Fayetteville Public Schools move forward with a plan to reopen schools this fall. And thank you for sitting through two hours Zoom board meeting. <laughs> that, that's a sacrifice. Yeah, that's I mean, this is why we're all here. <laughs> <sighs> we appreciate that, even that in and of itself. Well, you already had two big Zoom meetings, so hopefully we'll figure out I guess I'm thankful for Zoom and, and the opportunities it's allowed us, but um, I miss that in in-person interaction. So thank you all for for your insights and for your time to uh, lend to this to help us do this well. Okay, um, we are. I think. Wait. Let me get back to. We are done with our presentations and we're moving now into old business. Um, our first old business item has to do with the recommendation for the construction manager and architect for the new school and the athletic facilities. I believe we have Dr. Slocum here for that. Yes, ma'am. So Ms. Parker, are you able to click on that one? Thank you. Thank you. What you'll see here is there's a list of recommendations. I know that we we talked about uh, these recommendations uh, and you can see just on slide two, it's just a reminder of what those recommendations were. We talked about kind of the process that we went through for the RFQ and the RFP. And then we also took time, if you'll remember to, uh, for the board to interview the, the applicants that kind of rose to the surface. So I will turn it over to you, Ms. Waitsman. Okay, so this is an action item. Um, we discussed it pretty well um, at length last week uh, or last month, but if there are any other questions, um, we, are, we will entertain those now or concerns. Otherwise, um, I'll accept a motion to approve these recommendations for architect and construction manager. Nick, okay. I'll make a motion. Okay, Justin has made a motion to um, accept these recommendations for a construction manager and architectural firm to lead the construction of a new school and athletic facility. I'll second. And Tim will second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion from the board? Okay, then all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Everybody have your online option. Okay. Um, and then we'll move on to the school breakfast and lunch price increases. We also have Dr. Slocum here for that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President and the board. Uh, we also have Ms. Morachek here to answer any questions. If you'll remember last month, she gave an overview of the price increases along with the, this letter that was included last month. And this is seeking approval to put those recommendations into place. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions about those price increases? Additional questions? 
If not, I will entertain a motion to accept these, uh, to approve these new breakfast and lunch uh, prices for the 2021 school year. Anyone? Nick, I'll make the motion. Thank you, Justin is our token right. motion I'll maker. Second. I'll second it. Okay, good. <laughs> We have a motion from Justin and we have a second from Megan Hurley. Um, any discussion from the floor? Okay, all those, no discussion. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion carries seven to zero. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Dr. Slocum. Um, and then we are moving on to the third old business item, which um, has to do with the 21-22 school calendar. I believe we have Dr. Tucker here for that. No? Maybe? I believe Ms. Mathis was going to present that. Oh, excuse me. We have Cincy Mathis. I'm here. There she is. Yep. Okay. It's presenting the calendar for a vote, so. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions since he presented this last month? But um, if anyone had any further questions, otherwise um, I'll entertain a motion to accept, to approve this 21-22 uh, school calendar. Nika, I'll make that motion. There you go, Tracy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion from Tracy Pomeroy. Any seconds? All second. Who was that, Katrina? Yeah. Katrina. <laughs> and we have a second from Katrina. Um, any discussion from the floor? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, hey, motion carries uh, seven to zero. Thank you, Cincy. Thank you. Okay, and then finally, our final action item has to do with policy 5.24, um, a student extracurricular activity drug testing policy. I think this is Dr. Tucker. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President. Last month, I presented proposed updates to policy 5.24 and the procedures related to that policy. So tonight, I am just coming forward and asking for your uh, vote on this policy. Okay, we have two policies before, it. or wait, two policies? What's it's it? one policy and procedures. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, we have policy 5.24 and the procedures uh, that pertain to that here before the board. Any questions for Dr. Tucker? If not, I will accept a motion to approve policy 5.24 um, and the recommended uh, procedures uh, regarding student, student extracurricular activity drug testing. Anyone? I'll make a motion. Katrina makes a motion. And we have a second from... I'll second. second. Tracy Pomeroy. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and we have a second. Any further discussion from the from the floor? Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries seven to zero. Okay, now we have a couple um, new business items to discuss here. The first having to do with the, the calendar at Happy Hollow Elementary School. Um, we have Dr. Tucker here to discuss that with us. This yes, is not an action item as a reminder. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Given the uncertainty surrounding the 2020-2021 school year and the overwhelming um, recommendation from the Ready for Learning Task Force for consistency. Administration is recommending that we move Happy Hollow Elementary School to the traditional calendar for the upcoming school year. Dr. Colbert 
will work with any teacher or family um, that have previously scheduled trips during those dates that were, would have been intercession periods for Happy Hollow. Do we have any questions for Dr. Tucker regarding this recommendation? This is, as a reminder, this is something that we were planning to do a year from now anyway. Um, and we just, because of the pandemic and all of the complication that we're facing already, we just felt as a district it would be um, helpful to have everyone on the same calendar. Yes, ma'am. Nika. Nika, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to make a statement. Okay. Um, I, I know there are a lot of parents at Happy Hollow that are very excited about this change. So um, I think it's going to be met well with the public. So that's a good thing. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing that. And I know there there's a variety of perspectives on that. There always is on everything. But uh, but I, I definitely feel like this is something that is in the best interest of, of the district and, and really everybody that's involved. And also, I don't think there are going to be too many people taking advantage of those intercessions in the coming year. Um, well, hopefully we'll get back to normalcy sooner than later, but um, it doesn't feel like it right now. So <laughs> exactly. Thank uh, you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we have one more new business item um, from Mickey McFetridge with regard to the state required uh, school level improvement plans. That's right. Good evening, everybody. Um, just I'll keep this uh, pretty short and to the point. But of course, if you have any questions afterwards, I'd be glad to field them, even if that's through email later on. But our school level improvement plans. Um, the committees were still able to meet and meet the May 1st deadline to turn those plans into us. Um, when you look at them, you will not see a lot of adjustments for COVID-19 or any of those situations, but these plans are still focused more so on the academic piece um, for our students and what those goals are. So as you might remember, a year ago, we were able to change our template and our format to closer match the district strategic plan. And so you'll see that still in place. And each school team worked very hard. And I want to give a shout out to all the teachers and principals of each school building that really worked um, while we were doing in the middle of all the distance learning and all of that, because our deadlines did not change from the state on this. So um, just ask that you'll look at it and then the process would be next month. Um, we would ask that you would approve the plans and then we'll have them posted on our website by August 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Um, and I just wanted to say for our new board members, these, this, is, this is an interesting read. It's, it's a thick packet of information, but it's interesting to take a look at all the different ways that our individual schools and school leaders are um, prioritizing the things that we have prioritized in our plan. Um, it's, it, I think you'll find it encouraging. It's, it's good to, you don't have to read every little fine point, but it is helpful insight. And each school actually approaches the strategic plan differently with their own, um, sets of initiatives and priorities that they feel are, are, uh, you know, apply more specifically to their school. Yeah, I think that I think that these are really, really fun to read. Um, and I think that with this, not to, I mean, um, but that um, <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. I agree. <laughs> but I think I think that like our investment, they're, they're how our investment in our strategic plan rolls out. And that plan means nothing without these slip documents. I mean, it, like it is it is how it actually happens. And so um, I think it's really worth not only is it a blast, but I think it's really worth our time to see how that how that feels um, on the ground, which is where it actually exists. So it's full support for looking at the slip docs. And I do feel like it's um, well, of course, you know, we invested our heart and soul in the creation of that uh, strategic plan. So maybe we enjoy it more than other people do. But I feel like now <laughs> now that um, 
there's like some kind of common thread that's woven from school to school. It's a, it's actually quite an insight into the districts um, and how we're, you know, moving the ball. So, um, Keaton, oh, it looked like you were getting ready to say something. But do we have any questions for Mr. McPetridge? Okay, otherwise we will um, have this as an action item at our July meeting. Thank you for being here. Um, and then that's all we have for tonight, but I have a few things I wanted to mention. Um, speaking of July, um, we have the uh, board retreat uh, regarding facilities on July 16th, where we will get the opportunity to interact with these um, architects and CMs that we've approved. And we will begin to put some definition to these projects. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a process. Uh, eventually, we hope to provide an opportunity for the community to weigh in on these projects as well. And the plan is to do that in August, um, sometime after this uh, retreat. And we're still trying to figure out what that looks like. But my hope and Dr. Colbert's hope is that we can create a number of opportunities for people to engage, maybe um, multi-site or, or we use an online forum and an in-person forum. Uh, but we will get that hashed out um, in the near future. and. Put, press that out to the public so that they can plan to be a part of that. Um, and then also our hope is that that board meeting or that workshop and then also the later board meeting in, in July, we hope to do in person. So whoop, whoop. I know no one can, I can't hear any of you, but I can hear you saying whoop, whoop with me. Um, and then, uh, the, the final thing I wanted to mention is we still need to schedule our, our August um, or our strategic planning retreat. And I think we wanna get these facilities conversations going first. So we're gonna have the school, the facilities retreat in July, then we'll have these opportunities scheduled to engage the public in that conversation. And then probably late August to early September, we will um, set aside um, a day to um, look back at those metrics that we discussed at the February board retreat so that we can start to close some um, gaps on that and get that solidified as planned. Um, but I just, I think Dr. Colbert and I both felt together that this summer needs to be focused on reopening and um, doing that well and to, to try to bring our administrators together to present metrics to us regarding the strategic plan just didn't feel like the right thing at this time. So I hope you guys are okay with that. We will get those dates on the calendar within the next week or so, or at least we'll get some potential dates out to you in the next week or so. Does anybody have any questions about that or other comments they'd like to make before we adjourn? Dr. Colbert? Anything else? No, ma'am, I think that's it. Okay, then this meeting is adjourned. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you.